police discover the most gruesome murder they had ever come across in the small town of Clyde, Ohio, one detective in particular was determined to track down the depraved killer. However, the ghastly scene would not be the only shocking revelation in a case plagued by police corruption, where it seemed that an unhinged obsession placed blame on a group of innocent suspects, all while overlooking the monster hiding in plain sight, eventually landing a detective behind bars. The following interviews and interrogations have never been seen or heard before. Ooh. They've been analyzed by a qualified team, including a licensed attorney, a licensed clinical psychologist, a former licensed professional counselor, and a licensed professional counselor. Firm up, please. Do you have an emergency? Hi, I'll be over there in about 10 minutes to give you information about the um, woman that was murdered over there in Clyde. Heather Bogle was a devoted young mother working a graveyard shift at the local Whirlpool factory to support her five-year-old daughter. It was a means to an end, as she was also pursuing a career in nursing in order to better support herself and her little girl. On April 9, 2015, surveillance footage captured Heather leaving the Clyde facility at 6.17 a.m. No one could have ever imagined that this would be the last time Heather would be seen alive. The crime itself was unthinkable, but even more mind-blowing was the tangled web of deception that would be unraveled during the course of the investigation. It was the type of case where nothing was as it appeared to be. Holy fuck, dude. Heather He's had a history this up of depression. So Just two years prior, she'd allegedly attempted to take her own life and was prescribed the drug... Bro, first minute, one minute and 50 seconds in, he spoiled the whole goddamn video, man. Motrogene. Daggummit. Knowing this, after she went missing, her mother feared that another attempt may have been made, and a frantic search quickly ensued. It would only be one day before Heather's loved one's worst fears were confirmed. On April 10th, police located Heather's vehicle outside the Somerton Apartments on Hickory Street in Clyde, Ohio prompting officers to believe that she might have been inside Docs. of the complex. However, they quickly learned that this was sadly not the case. They never anticipated that, while searching Heather's car, they would open the trunk to find the missing woman's lifeless body resting inside. Jesus Christ. Authorities were barely able to stomach the horrendous wounds that Heather had endured, including various bruises and marks among her legs, arms, and face indicating that someone had mercilessly beaten her. Not only this, but shockingly, her hair had been cut off at the scalp, what and her fingernails fuck? were shaven all the way down to the cuticles. She had marks around her wrists and ankles, signifying that she'd been bound and tied. Ultimately, her cause what of death fuck? was determined to be two gunshots to her back, which punctured vital organs in her chest. Defensive wounds found on Heather's hands told investigators that despite the horrific... Bro, the way the, the narration works on this makes it seem like he is so hyped up for this level of murder. Like, he's just like, the murder was so sick. Like, that's what it seems like. <laughs> oh, man, emote a little less, you know what I mean? Attack. She fought for every... They got the fucking Winamp guy. Winamp, it really whips the llama's ass. A dude to do the fucking narration every time. Last second of her life. Along with this, it was determined that her Galaxy Samsung cell phone, purse, a set of keys, and Whirlpool work shirt were all missing. The police, too stunned to comprehend the horrific sight before them, were now on a manhunt for the mysterious killer. But unbeknownst to them, their window of time was closing by the second. Still, they had a lead. Heather had been facing a rather tumultuous season in her life. She was in the middle of a devastating breakup with an ex-girlfriend, Carmela Badillo, and the relationship hadn't necessarily ended on good terms. Both of the women had met during their time at Whirlpool, and they officially began dating in 2014. Throughout the romance, the couple would often fight over various subjects, but... At the forefront were Heather's supposed allegations of infidelity against Carmela. It wasn't long before their issues would create a permanent rift between the two, and the year-long relationship would come to an end just three days before Heather's disappearance. In texts recovered through Heather's phone company on April 8th, the fury between the two was clear. In one message, Carmela stated, 
Last night wasn't something small, Heather. I have to make appointments with a cardiologist and was doing various tests all night. I thank God for my mom being there. She's the only one who will ever have my back and care about me. I would have never not been by your side. I don't ever in this lifetime want to speak to you again. Goodbye. Apparently, Carmela had faced an unexpected illness the previous night and requested that Heather come to her aid, even though they'd been... Bro, I have an unexpected illness in the form of forgetting to run the top of the hour ad break, by the way, and then running it at 425. I'm sorry to everyone I've disappointed. I apologize. I, I literally, it was like 4... It was like around 410 when I was looking for a good segue, and I totally fucking forgot. I'm an L streamer. Uh, you know, Nord Shark Saboteur, thank you for the 10 gift of subs, allowing 10 people to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour, even though it's no longer the top of the hour. Here's the three-minute ad break now. Have your resignation on my desk in an hour and hand over your badge. What about my gun? What about my service weapon? Can I keep that? broken up, but seeing as she had a shift to attend, Heather was unable to make it. In response, Heather wrote, I had your back. I couldn't lose my job. I'm already so far behind in bills, it's ridiculous. And I have nobody to help me out or even be here for me. And you kept pushing away. I wanted to be there for you. I honestly did and still do. But I understand I cannot know what is going on if you do not talk to me but please do continue to take everything out on me. Following the breakup, Heather also texted her friend, Jerry Avalos, on April 8th, saying, I deactivated Facebook and all other social media. Literally. Damn, bro, 4.79? Um, good attempt, Hossie, dead? Wow, bro. Y'all are fucking ruthless, dude. Bunch of... Micromanagers up my ass. She never talked to my friends. Couldn't even have a friend. She wouldn't allow it. It's a clear red flag when a partner tries to control who the other person can talk to or be friends with. It's important to remember that Heather was upset about the breakup when she sent this message. And it's possible that Carmela has a very different viewpoint on their relationship. When officers recovered Heather's body, they also discovered a shocking handwritten letter in the vehicle. It was one of passion and rage, each sentence more intense than the last. Unfortunately, it's unknown what was written, but every single word had been directed at Heather, almost as if they wanted to hurt her. To no surprise, the penman had been none other than her scorned ex-girlfriend. But this wasn't the only relationship that seemed to be falling apart for Heather, as additional texts showcased an obscene message from her brother, Josh Fiesel. Heather had recently failed one of her nursing exams, and Josh added to the upsetting occasion. He wrote, too stupid to pass the LPN exam, and called her a demeaning name. He also texted, low expectations of yourself, typical trash like your mom and dad. Josh's cruelty towards Heather was no secret to their friends and family. What the fuck? But could he have gone so far as to take her life? Well, the lead detective on the case, Sean O'Connell, had his eyes set on uncovering the answer. Arrest this man. I'm getting some bad vibes about this detective. For no particular reason, you know what I mean? To this very question. However, as we will soon come to learn, his methods were far from the ordinary. Still, no one could have predicted the scandal that was about to unravel. Despite the varying fights with Carmela and Josh, it wouldn't take long before they were dismissed as potential suspects. I think as it could be the, the detective. Continued, Guys. Detective O'Connell quickly located a new person of interest. Tenants had reportedly told the detective that they had seen Heather frequently visiting Building 240 of the Somerton Apartments, well before her body was found in the parking lot. It was believed that she would allegedly purchase marijuana from an unknown resident of the complex. When this information was discovered, Detective O'Connell began to dig and eventually found his new lead suspect, 24-year-old Keona Bohr, thanks to a complaint filed against her by another occupant. 
it alleged that the scent of marijuana was emanating from her apartment. Kiona, a mother of two, was supposedly very nervous while speaking with police after Heather's body was discovered, and Detective O'Connell found this to be rather odd. Though she denied any involvement, O'Connell wasn't convinced. Despite this, following her discussion with the authorities, Kiona wrote a series of strange Facebook posts, especially under the given circumstances. I can't believe this just happened, and doing eight to ten years for murder and pleading insanity could be seen amongst her account, only furthering the detective's suspicions. Not only this, but according to two residents of the Somerton Apartments, Kiona was allegedly seen wearing the same red Mickey Mouse t-shirt that Heather's body had been dressed in well before the tragic event. And lastly, Kiona had been romantically involved with 39-year-old Julian Kaiser, who Detective O'Connell helped to put behind bars for 10 years on a first drug offense. It seemed that the evidence against Kiona was beginning to mount. Four days after Heather's body was recovered, Kiona was interviewed by Detective O'Connell and... I think, I think the main reason why everyone was probably suspicious of the detective is because he was doing the most to solve this. You know what I mean? Like he was, he was going above and beyond. He's like, oh well, it must be this guy. Oh well, it must be that guy. Then You're like arrest everybody. I I, should, I think he worked a little too hard. He wasn't even clocking overtime. You know what I mean? Everyone was like, what the fuck's going on, detective? It, you seem to be really invested in this uh, case. Like, this is not a television show. Only on TV shows do we have detectives be this invested in cases. And as you're about to see, the tension in the room was so thick, it could have been cut with a knife. Mm -hmm. Do you know that name by chance, Heather Bogle? I don't okay. even know who she is. The only time I heard of her was when the police knocked on the door, and then I didn't even know who she was. I was like, I don't know her. And then I went inside and got on my Facebook, and I seen her on Facebook. Obviously, for one reason or another, her vehicle ends up at the Hickory Street Apartments parked in front of your building 240. The question is, why did it end up there? So we have talked to a lot of people, and we are comfortable to say that Heather has been known to frequent building 240. We feel comfortable that she was voluntarily there probably on Thursday of last week um a couple different times um she was there then her vehicle had left and the vehicle had come come back and then the vehicle leaves and then it finally comes back for the last time on friday morning and around 1 30 okay so why why am i here though and I'm, I'm getting to that point um <clears throat> it's my understanding that heather likes to smoke some weed Okay, she does it on a, almost probably on a somewhat of a regular basis. She has to buy it from somebody. We know that we've had complaints on your particular apartment in reference to odor of marijuana coming from it from one time or another that led to the police knocking on the door and trying to figure out. Bro, decriminalization of marijuana really fucked over cops. Nobody ever thinks about that. You know what I mean? Like, how else are you going to fucking lock up, like, uh, or, or suspect uh, random black people for doing crimes other than uh, blaming the scent of marijuana? You know what I mean? It's a big, it's a big deal. Nobody ever talks about uh, policing as an institution and the, and the damage that, like, decriminalization of marijuana caused. In many states, really. The police has never came to my door. If the police came to my door, they better have a report. The police never knocked there on my is, door. There is a police report. They talked to me. There's they spoke to me. There's a police report on March 18th. Without going back and looking at their police report, I'm not going to say that they talked to you or not, but I know there is a police report, and there are incidents reports with management pertaining to the smell of marijuana coming from your apartment. So why hasn't anybody said anything to me previously? I don't. My landlord, the That's police. That's a good question. I, That's I, I, I guess real we, sketchy because yesterday a white man came up to me and asked me, were you the one that they had got in trouble for smoking weed that was smelling like weed in the hallway? And I said, no, that wasn't me. I don't even smoke weed. And he said, well, I do every now and then, whoop, whoop, trying to sure. get me to say something. So it was probably him that tried to call y'all. This is so sad. I mean, it's crazy. Like, y'all just raided my house. I work at a nursing home. I'm a single mom with two kids. Like, this is crazy. I understand. I understand. 
Kiona comes across as quite self-assured. When someone is telling the truth, they may appear more confident because they know the facts are on their side. The detective should have built some kind of relationship with her prior to starting into questions about Heather. Essentially, what he has done here is without any evidence whatsoever, he has launched into an interrogation rather than conduct an actual interview first. It's my understanding, and another thing that kind of supports what we're looking at is the idea that you are or have the... Yeah, I mean, detectives would never do that to a black woman. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> sure, this is the only time when he's... <laughs> This is the only time, this is the first and the last time he's ever done that, you know? <laughs> the guy from Mississippi that used to work at Whirlpool, correct? Who would say that? Well, it's... I never dated anybody just because I talked okay. to somebody. Like, All right, so you talked to somebody. You They're not even yourself. here. They've been left months and months and months ago. So. Okay, what's months and months and months ago? Like months ago when they went home, we was never dating. I. Who's the two guys that keep coming and going out of your apartment? It doesn't matter. It does matter. How does it matter? My personal because business, I don't have any, I don't know this girl. Your personal business is not becoming our business. Okay, so who I sleep with is your business. No, no, no. Like, I mean, that's what I do. He's like, wait a minute, you you fucked them? Uh, tell me more about the, the gruesome details. That's all I'm doing, so that doesn't have anything to do with this. That's yeah. what I'm saying. That well, these are the questions that we're going to ask, and these are the questions we're asking. Okay, well, I mean, if I need a lawyer, I can get a lawyer, it's but I don't. You can. I mean, you, I'm just you're saying. Not under, you're not yeah. charged with anything. We're you're not investigating under a homicide. If we can tie your apartment into a homicide you investigation. You can't tie my apartment. You can just, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I know you can't. I don't just, even know this girl, so I know. Bro, he said we can tie your apartment to the homicide investigation. Like, yeah, I know that the law allows people to lie. Okay. I know that the the law allows cops to lie in interrogations, but pretty wild. Pretty wild to just like, you know, <laughs> directly be like, no, we can tie we can tie you to the you know investigation. No, but that's like, we'll find a way, man. Can't. Chill. Apparently, two different men had visited Kiona at her apartment on various occasions in the recent past. As a Omar threat, Satchel and Kerry Jeffrey. It wasn't long before Detective O'Connell considered them additional suspects in Heather's gruesome murder, and soon we will see exactly why that was. But this is the thing. This, that's why we're asking. That's why we're asking the questions. And if right, you but you guys just raided my apartment. You know, yesterday when I went to my house and got that paper, my neighbors ran for me. Like, I'm out here killing people. Like, y'all just ruined my life over this because I smoked some weed. Like, this is crazy. Okay, we had probable cause to search your apartment. Okay, that's fine, but I'm just saying, like, that's... Uh, All right. I don't even... I've never seen this girl in my life. Don't okay, know maybe this girl you have, it, but maybe those who you associate yourself with have. Maybe... People they associate themselves with. Did you talk to the previous Why neighbors that lived there? Why are you being so reluctant on wanting to tell us who you associate with? Because y'all just raided my house and took my baby daddy to prison for 11 years. You know what it sounds like to me, Fiona? It sounds what? like you're withholding information. No, it sounds like I don't... This is ridiculous. There is an important distinction here with Kiona talking about getting a lawyer. She didn't unequivocally ask to speak with a lawyer, which is why the officer continued talking to her. If this case were to go to trial... Kiona's attorneys could have argued that this should have been interpreted as a request for counsel, but it's not incumbent upon police to clarify statements, and they don't have to stop an interrogation if a suspect makes an ambiguous statement about requesting counsel. This means that the burden of clearly invoking the right rests with the suspect. It's also important to note that though Kiona is being questioned by officers, she was free to leave at any time and was neither detained nor under arrest which means that the Miranda requirements are not in play here. It also appears that the officer was allowing a motion to control him. It's apparent he did little to build rapport with Kiona, and the major example of this is by accusing her of having something to hide. The most important aspect of Reed is to effectively have officers be viewed as advocates, possibly even allies, rather than as adversaries. Instead, the officer should have engaged in asking more open-ended questions, rather than throwing multiple accusations at Kiona. By failing to literally be curious and invite Kiona to tell her story, the officer instead made judgments which shut down further discourse and didn't do anything to win her over. It's not uncommon to see officers become frustrated during an interview or interrogation for a number of reasons. 
However, a much better strategy is to show the suspect a way out of the mess they find themselves in. This way out is generally couched as the truth will set you free. Most of the time, it won't set them physically free, but it can be a means to unload a burden via telling officers the truth. In these circumstances, officers emphasize remaining open and non-accusatory, even when presenting facts that contradict previous statements. This allows the conversation to continue. This shot has ruined my life for some little... Hey, we didn't ruin well, anything. It's a little, it's a homicide. I mean, but I don't know anything well, about it, but this, this is what I'm talking Apparently you do because you're not telling us who your, your boyfriends are. I don't so, have boyfriends. And who are the guys that keep coming it and going? I don't know. It does matter because we're talking about a homicide. I mean, if, I, if I'm, am I being charged with something? Am I getting arrested? Not no. yet. Okay, then. I, I mean, we can. I can get a lawyer and come back. Yes. If you get a lawyer, go get a lawyer. That just tells me you got something to hide. I don't have what the fuck yo these guys are so bad at their fucking jobs dude these are supposed to be like higher tier cops too like you know what i mean holy fuck brother you and this attitude that you are demonstrating is one of the best reasons to literally always have a fucking lawyer when you're talking to cops Never talk to cops without the presence of a lawyer. This is it. This is the reason. It's not bad at their job if they know they won't get in trouble. I mean, no, no, they are bad at their jobs on top of like not being able to, uh, regardless of whether there's no scrutiny on, on their behavior here, they are bad at their fucking jobs. Well, th at least the detective is bad at his job because he's the real murderer. Spoiler alert. Uh, the officer is just fucking bad at his job. Because ostensibly, you are, the, the assumption here is that the officer is trying to find who the fucking murderer is. You know what I mean? anything to hide well, but i know how y'all are need. Yo, how are we I don't because we got your boyfriend and father your baby with a bunch of dope and he's right. been a doper for his whole entire life okay so, we're, we're in the so, wrong so that's that. why you raided my house no that's not probably, why that's probably because why. you had marijuana in your house but you didn't know that yeah we did we how had reason to believe it you had reason to believe that because somebody yeah, said probably that. Probably because, because someone said something. they smelled odor never been in my house never talked to me the police didn't come to my door and see if there was marijuana your association with with Julian Kaiser when you've been in prison in? for how long? I don't care. You're still associated, so, with, I'm associated with the That's insane. Like, oh yeah, you dated someone who used to sell drugs, which means that like you're still ill. <laughs> what the fuck? Bro, that's wild to just like openly state that. That's wild. Yeah, by the way, that, that exact same logic is how Breonna Taylor got murdered, for the record. Um, you know, that is what happened to her as well in a no-knock raid. The, the guilt by association. It's insane. All right, you in know prison? what? Do you want to talk or not? I don't want to talk. Okay, have a good day. Thank you. So You're now involved in a homicide investigation. Yeah, very good. Bro, he's just like using that as a as a thing. You know what I mean? Ah, guess what? Fuck fuck you're gonna do about it, you know? You're you're a black woman, you have no power here, is is the attitude that he has. You know what I mean? It's insane. The detectives may be misinterpreting Kiona's reluctance to share the names of the two men. She's likely trying to protect her friends, but that does not mean they are guilty. It's also <laughs> yeah, extremely no manipulative shit. for the detective to tell her that by asking for a lawyer, she had something to hide, when in actuality, he was just irritated that she was making a smart decision for herself. Nonetheless, the unrelenting pressure from the detectives left all parties in a state of frustration. But Kiona was living a real-life nightmare, suspected of murder and was now in a fight for her life. After the troubling interview, authorities were looking into the possibility of charging three people with the crime as they began to investigate Omar and Kairi. Omar, who had previously served prison time for home invasion and firearm charges, had allegedly sold marijuana to Heather, as reported by O'Connell. 
although this has never been confirmed. When police finally spoke with Omar, he supposedly admitted to having stolen a 380 caliber firearm from his fiance, but claimed to have sold the gun to a resident living in Michigan not long after. Along with this, authorities allegedly found him to be in possession of unidentified pills and a pocket knife with a blonde strand of hair attached. In an interview with the Fremont what? News Messenger, Omar adamantly denied that he had ever met or known Heather, gravely pleading for his innocence. In a shocking quote, he described his encounter with Detective O'Connell by saying that, Sean O'Connell told me I know it's not you, but I'll make it you. Of course, the detective would deny having ever uttered the threat, but the truth of the matter remains up in the air. Be that as it may, later actions by O'Connell that you'll soon learn of might have you drawn. I mean, I saw enough uh, evidence, uh, uh, at least like uh, with, you know, with respect to his character, this detective's character that like, I believe it. You know what I mean? Straight up. I mean, he basically said that to the to the other lady. I 100% believe it. I mean, obviously, we know that he's the one who did it, right? But, like... On your own conclusions. Omar also stated that during the days of April 8th through the 10th, when Heather was missing, he was residing at the Days Inn Hotel. At the time of Heather's murder, he claimed to have been visiting three separate bars in the Fremont area. However, wait, the detective is not the one who did the crime. It wait, has what, also really? been reported that he was actually hiding at Kiona's apartment in an attempt to evade an arrest warrant. Despite this, O'Connell was still extremely skeptical and supposedly insinuated that Omar could have still traveled from the various locations to commit the crime. Still, his focus shifted to his final suspect, 26 year old Kayri. As a supposed friend of Omar's, Kayri was just as much on Detective O'Connell's radar and he would do anything to prove their guilt. According to a source, Kayri was apparently seen throwing a suspicious black bag into a river on April 10th, 2015, presumably containing a firearm. O'Connell asserted that the supposed gun was used in a homicide, potentially Heather's, and quickly released a full dive team to recover the weapon. But to O'Connell's dismay, the search would prove to be unsuccessful. Claiming that Kiona, Omar, and Kairi were likely the murderers. Wait, does that mean that there was no gun? That they could recover? Like, or did they recover a gun and then they couldn't find information on the gun? Like, where's the bag? There's no bag, no gun, no nothing. The detective was still missing one important piece of information, the motive. Why would any of them want to hurt Heather, let alone kill her? Let alone kill her in this gruesome and incredibly personal way. Like, the fact that they, like, I, I mean, you know, number one thing when you look at a murder like this, we, we're all murder watchers. We all are experienced murder watchers, like, the killer definitely knew this person. Like, unless there is a serial killer around, like, you know, the, the 80s style, uh, 70s style serial killer running around doing this kind of shit to other people as well, that is an incredibly personal murder. Like, scalping the person, shooting them in the back twice. There was clearly, like, back and forth on top of that. Uh, you know, there's defensive wounds. Like, it seems like uh, this is a, this is like a very personal murder. Not even O'Connell could say, but suddenly, in the blink of an eye, another disappointment abruptly struck the desperate detective, and it would send the case in an entirely different direction. Underneath Heather's fingernails was a small amount of DNA. The results were shocking, concluding that neither Kiona, Omar, or Kayri had come back as a positive match. In an instant, their names were cleared. Oh, at least <laughs> big bummer for the detective. He's like, oh, man, I tried to log up as many black people as I could in proximity to this car that we, uh, this vehicle that we found with the body. And uh, it really, it really fucking destroyed my case, you know? Oh, man, I hate it when that shit happens. At least that's what should have happened. Instead, O'Connell stuck to oh his my original God. claims, 
not stopping to even ponder the possibility that he might have been wrong. What the fuck? But his delusions would only lead him further away from the actual killer. This just goes to show how detectives can sometimes develop tunnel vision and narrow in on a suspect while ignoring other possibilities. Bro, this was like, what the fuck is going on? No, this is not narrowing in on a suspect, man. Did this guy do the murder himself? Like, I thought that was the case. Now chat's like debating me saying that's not the case. I don't, I'm like a little confused about what's happening here. But like, this isn't just tunnel vision. This is a guy who's going extra hard on, on like as many black people as he can. He's like, oh, there were black people in the vicinity of the car that we, uh, we, we recovered uh, the body from. So seems like, you know, Seems like, uh, you know, this, this case is open and shut. Despite sufficient evidence, O'Connell had already spent a lot of time on the premise that Kiona, Omar, and Carey were involved in Heather's death. He may have been afraid that if he admitted his mistake, he would look incompetent to both the public and to other members of law enforcement. In addition, he was likely experiencing a psychological principle known as confirmation bias. This means that people are more likely to accept information that supports what they already believe and, on the other hand, may discount information that doesn't align with those beliefs. With this in mind... Or he could have been racist, too. I mean, I just think, like, how quickly he jumped to her is, is very weird. And just over a year later, Kiona is demanding answers. I just want to know when y'all can tell her that I'm not involved in work and not be clear my she she she's she, she says you know that her you know her DNA won't come back it's it's you know at what point do we say okay are you going to go for a year, the detective would supposedly harass Kiona, frequenting her place of work with additional officers. What? At one point he apparently gathered Kiona's co-workers for a meeting although the subject of the matter has never been reported. It wouldn't be too long before the single mother found herself out of work while struggling to make ends meet. Every job interview for a new position was to no avail, what? and it seemed that O'Connell was never going to let her out of his grasp. These were likely acts of intimidation on O'Connell's part, which is a form of manipulation. He may have believed that he could scare Kiona into confessing, which would have been coercion. Yet, after securing a lawyer, Kiona was able to restrict her contact with the detective. But that wouldn't stop O'Connell from allegedly speaking with her acquaintances. In an interview with the Sandusky Register, Kiona recalled a time when she traveled to her local tattoo artist and was startled to learn that, after she left the establishment, Detective O'Connell had allegedly made his way in to speak with the artist. Other accounts recall that Bro, this guy was just, like, stalking her. Like, what the fuck? Okay, this isn't, like, police work. This is just, like... I mean, I... I bro, this... Okay, the title is apt. The detective is a criminal, okay? Like, the detective is, like, straight up... At this point, the detective is doing crimes. There's no more murder investigation. He's just like, yeah, I took matters into my own hands, like... I'm just going to harass the fuck out of this person. That the detective apparently had residents of the Somerton apartments act as informants for the investigation, hoping to gain more details on Kiona. I'm not here to say that you did do it, but I'm not here to say that you didn't do it. Okay, but I know for a fact that you guys got my DNA back and there's no matches. I know for a fact that you guys went through my phone record, there's no matches. I know for a fact that y'all been looking at my Facebook. Okay. There's nothing. I know that. Kiona's suspicious Facebook posts, as previously described, had actually been in response to Julian's prison sentence. And not only this, but she had never been in possession of the Mickey Mouse shirt found on Heather. Regardless of these revelations, the detective pressed on. Yeah, it is what it is. If you're not involved, then you're not involved. You're okay, not. so let's even clear me, though, because me and my kids... I don't think we're comfortable to be able to say for sure that it's not you. This reign of terror would eventually come crashing down. Bro, I think the detective did it. I I'm sorry. It's something. You know what he wasn't doing? Fucking police work. That's right. That's what he wasn't doing. What the fuck? In an attempt to seek an indictment, O'Connell had written a report to the prosecution, 
but failed to include that the DNA found on Heather did not match any of the three suspects. Along with this, he refrained from giving all of his case files to the county prosecutor and dismissed every other lead besides those relating to the trio. He even ignored a critical piece of information sent in an email by a Whirlpool employee just two days after Heather was found. And by the way, I don't know if you have any suspects, but I know someone who works at Whirlpool that is very capable of doing it that. Read, want. And by the way, I don't know if you have any suspects, but I know someone who works at Whirlpool that is very capable of doing that to a woman. This crucial lead would eventually become integral, but in his determination to convict Kiona, Omar, and Kairi, O'Connell did not even take it into consideration. However, this would not go unnoticed. Soon, O'Connell was caught giving a copy of the investigation report to an employee working for the Sandusky County Department of Job and Family Services, claiming that he wanted to gain their insight on a person of interest in the case. Once this was discovered by the sheriff, the detective was immediately placed on leave, but it only took a week to uncover the extent of it. Bro, think about it this way. He got so racist and so stalker-like that, like, he was placed on leave, something that cops rarely ever get put on unless, it, like, even when they fucking kill someone, okay? Even when they kill, like, an unarmed person fleeing from the back, that's the only time when they, like, if there's, a, you know, public outcry, they put him on fucking paid leave, you know what I mean? The level of, uh, the, the level of malpractice in this regard got to a point where they were just like, bro, you are literally fucking up county resources, okay? You got to fucking chill out. Like, we all, the sheriff was like, listen, we all love this Sandusky, Ohio. We love to do racism here, okay? But, you know, you got to do it piece by piece. You got to do a little bit, you know? It's like when the baklava comes in and you want to have fucking all the baklava, you can't have more than, like, four or five pieces. You know, you got to save some. Got to save some racism for the rest of us, Okay? If you eat all of it at once, like, there's not going to be any left for anybody else. Stop. You're doing too much. You're doing too much racism, dog. Please. Okay? Baklava on the mind? Yes. I mean, a little bit. I'll be honest, how many ate yesterday? Four. I ate four pieces of baklava. It's okay? malpractice. As a result, the detective was quickly let go from his position and was facing an increasing amount of legal charges. Shut the fuck up. Former Sandusky County Sheriff Kyle Overmeyer will be released from prison on Monday. Wait, this is a different. This isn't the guy. Wait, this. Is that him? No, that's the boss. Wait, hold on. Vic Kiona, Omar, and Kayrie. Bro, stop, stop, stop. You're spoiling. I didn't look at any, anything. I didn't look at anything. But I think the sheriff himself even to got To uncover fucking... the extent of his malpractice. As a result, the detective was quickly let go from his position and was facing an increasing amount of legal charges, which included misleading a public official and tampering with evidence. O'Connell had broken the law that he vowed to protect and was eventually sentenced to two years in prison. That's bullshit, by the way. Like, what? Cops... No, here's, he, okay, I got to say something here, okay? No, that doesn't, that doesn't sit right with me. First of all, first of all, cops never go to fucking jail for this kind of shit. That is insane. Let alone two years, are you insane? There's got to be some other additional reasons for why this happened, the way that it happened, because no fucking shot. Bro, cops literally plant shit openly and very publicly. They plant evidence, and it and, it, and, it, and then, like, the Department of Justice will come in and, like, actually take a look at the books. And they will find people. They will literally find cops that have openly fucking planted evidence. And it doesn't matter. Like, it still doesn't matter. Those guys still don't go to fucking jail. Okay? Maybe they'll be let go. And then maybe a couple years later, uh, that cop will pop up somewhere else, you know, at another precinct or whatever. No, this guy, this guy probably wasn't, they get, no, even when they get caught on camera, they don't get fucking uh, uh, thrown in jail. They have to do something extraordinary to go to jail. The Baltimore police are a perfect example of that. Exactly. 
It's not just that they were... Those Baltimore cops didn't go to fucking jail or didn't go to prison because they were planting drugs and planting guns on suspects and shit like that. They did it over and over again while also stealing money from people. They also uh, did overtime fraud. Like, you have to... Okay, you have to... It, it, it's, it's similar to what I always say about, like, if you steal from the poor, you become wealthy. If you steal from the wealthy, you go to jail. It's kind of similar to that. Cops don't go... Uh, cops don't pay, face any serious punishments for doing cop shit, like uh, planting evidence or, you know, being racist or whatever. They get in trouble if they are misusing department resources and misusing department funds. Okay? Like, that is the... And, and they're doing it with, like, wanton disregard. You know what I mean? Something like that. Yeah. Overtime fraud was the biggest part of the reason why the Baltimore Police Department actually took action against these cops. That's what it was. Because they were just like aggressively fucking uh, taking uh, money from the overtime funds. Like they were aggressively billing overtime. <sighs> Police overtime fraud just proves they're the hardest working people in our society. That's why they're heroes. Yeah, exactly. He got in trouble for wasting the DA's time knowing the DNA wouldn't match up. I think that could be the reason. You know what I mean? I, I, that, that could probably be the reason. He could be a fucking top-of-the-hour dodger. You know, that's a big crime. At the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. If you no longer want to see those ads, um, you know, all you need to do is subscribe, which you could do for $5 or for free with the Twitch Prime. You remember the Asian bodybuilder cop who went around sexually assaulting women and how they brought him in and they were still buddy-buddy saying, ah, oh, it happens, man. Yo, that Asian bodybuilder cop situation was way more weird than, than uh, the way we uh, looked at it on YouTube videos, okay? There were a lot of fucking cops that were arrested for, like, pedophilia and, and sexual assault after that guy. Um, I remember leaving that situation thinking he might have been considered a fucking fall guy for the, for the whole thing. Anyway, um, don't be a fall guy to the top of the hour, though. Uh, like I said, if you subscribe or get gifted a sub, if you're lucky, uh, you can avoid the top of the hour ad break. Yeah, Daniel Holtzclaw, Heike got a lot of other dudes' crimes put on him. Yeah, that was a very weird fucking case, dude. Cat named Dog, thank you for the 10 gifted subs. Womack7, thank you for the uh, 5 gifted subs. Allowing 15 people to no longer see the eyes at the top of the air. Here's a three-minute ad break now. Although this would not be the end of the shocking corruption, seeing as how another scandal had just as quickly broken through the walls of this quiet and quaint little town. Sheriff Kyle Overmeyer, also working on Heather's case, had been caught stealing drugs from the drug take-back boxes in northwestern Ohio. Facing an ongoing opioid addiction, Kyle was sentenced to four years in prison in December of 2016. But during this time, he was able to sit down with authorities to give his side of the story on what happened with former Detective O'Connell. And we'll get into more on Sean about what he did, but you know, a lot of stuff was secret squirrel with him, and he he did his own thing, and I entrusted in him as a detective, and you know, because you can't do it all, you can't be a detective and a sheriff and wear all the hats. He was dead set on Keanu Bohr, and then he found out that Omar might have been out. Was hiding out there, he was there that night supposedly, and there was a warrant for his arrest. And that's where it all unraveled, where he became obsessed. Why is that? I don't know. See, now here's another thing I'm being told. Yeah. That he had a personal vendetta against Keanu Bohr, Kyle gives a brief rundown on how O'Connell helped to imprison Keona's ex-boyfriend, Julian, and why that might have placed the single mother at the top of his suspect list in Heather's case. Now, in speaking to Heather's family members mm -hmm. and Carmela Badillo, they all indicated that the three people that provided Heather her drugs were... And then was the other... Oh, there's only three. Nobody ever mentioned Keona Bohr. Right. So I don't know how he's getting in and going, Keona Bohr... And, and if he's making that up, then, right? And, and correct? I, yes. All the while, residents across the community were stumped when it came to who might have carried out such a gruesome crime. And some were inclined to leave their thoughts on the most popular social media platform, Facebook. For Ohio, for Ohio. One user wrote a post insinuating that Carmela, Heather's ex-girlfriend, 
may actually be the one that authorities were looking for. The sad thing about this is just a few days after it happened, my brother worked with a guy who no longer works there with him, but he stopped over and told me his sister and Heather had a thing and that she might have had something to do with it. I called O'Connell to report what I was told at the time, but nothing was done. Was Heather's ex-girlfriend the perpetrator who'd been hiding in plain sight, or was there someone else sneakily going unnoticed? Still. I mean, both of those, I don't know, right? I don't know the details, because unfortunately we only know whatever this fucking dipshit uh, uncovered. But, like, like, literally, the... You know, there are there are key suspects in any murder that you immediately either clear or suspect of committing the fucking murder. It's the people closest to the to the victim. Okay? It's it's bananas that like you wouldn't even <laughs> you wouldn't even suspect like a former ex or anything like that. Not saying that not saying that, like, she did it or whatever, obviously, but, you know, if you're going to play the stat game, which cops love doing or love claiming that they do, statistically speaking, it's always proximity. The closest to the victim. Others had their own opinions. One person even stated that he knew more about the situation than most. A lot of time and dedication was lost, and I have proof. I want it done right. I had to bring up a perfected parliament to do what I did and walk it through like a gentleman. Most eerie of all, this person was well aware that corruption was lurking. The oh, fuck? I trust very few when the problem goes all the way to the top. In addition to the online chatter, others took their concerns directly to authorities. One account in particular stood out. Michael Abdu, a resident of Fremont, Ohio, was in a frantic rush to give a statement on an alleged conversation that had taken place at a nearby bar. Fremont Police, do you have an emergency? Hi, I'll be over there in about 10 minutes to give you information about the um, woman that was murdered over there in quiet. Michael claims that he met three men at the local bar, where one had allegedly explained to him that he ordered the hit on Heather. Michael refers what? to this man as Mississippi. Two other gentlemen had also been present, but he didn't know their names. Absolutely. What the fuck is happening in like small ass bumfuck Sandusky, Ohio, man? What is going on, dude? What are the, is it because like these people are fucking really bored? Yeah, this is some Fargo shit, dude. Are they just like bored? So they're, like, making stuff up? Like, what the fuck? Who? What? They informed me how they killed her in the residence and took her body and put it in the trunk of the car. He said, if you got any family, I suggest you um, do the right thing. I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. And then he said, uh, I was the person that took care of the white girl over in Clyde. The black man said this. Write that down, black man. Finally, we got a different black guy. And I said to him, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I'm here to like roll on Clyde. He said, what? Ask the two. Bro, I can't hear. We take care of business. So I went and asked the two guys in flash. Hi. Dude said you guys took you know, I said Mississippi said you guys took care of those two or took care of the girl over there in Clyde. <clears throat> he said, Yeah, we gave that to what she deserved. The one dude turned to the other guy and said, Shut the fuck up. Why would anybody walk up to a random bald guy in a fucking bar and be like, Hey, by the way, we did a gruesome murder, just letting you know. And it was like a facilitated hit on a fucking single mom. Like just some random white lady. You know what I mean? Like that would never happen. The other one then said, dude's cool. 
Whatever you gotta say, I'm cool with, you know, I'm not, you know, going to go nowhere. Michael, clearly stunned by the recent encounter, provided a new lead for the authorities. However, just as quickly, police were able to conclude that they'd reached a dead end yet again, due to the fact that his story couldn't be corroborated by other patrons of the bar. It was clear that from the onset of Heather's case, each and every day had been afflicted by injustice. Fortunately, that wouldn't last for long. The day had finally come where a new sheriff was in town, determined to track down the real killer with no time to waste. Oh, boy. Sheriff Chris Hilton quickly dismissed the previous suspects along... For the record, <coughs> clearance rates are abysmal in this country across the board, but I suspect, like, in small towns like this is even fucking worse, I guess. Like, what the hell's going on? It's been, like, a year at this point since the murder took place. It, like... Do they not have a lot of other murders going on? Or do they also are just like this bad at, at covering all the other murders too? Like. The wildest shit happens in small towns. About 12 years back, a surgeon hired a successful hit on a city councilman. Wait, what? With Carmela. And soon enough, he'd also pinpointed exactly where Heather had been following her last shift at Whirlpool. Through her Gmail account, authorities were able to see her movements throughout the entire day of April 9th, thanks to the several electronic coordinates kept in Google's GPS function. This indicated that around 6.30 in the morning, Heather had been at a trailer park home in the Emerald Estates lot, a little over a mile away from Whirlpool. She remained there for at least an hour before her phone had apparently been shut off. The residence was that of 44-year-old Daniel Myers, one of Heather's co-workers at Whirlpool. The authorities were able to speak with Daniel on May 24, 2017, Wait. over two years after Heather's disappearance. How you doing, Dan? Hey, Nick Katsopoulos with the Sheriff's Office. Would you be able to take a few minutes and talk to us? For what reason? I mean, well, we're working a, a cold case homicide. Do you still work for... Bitch, that shit didn't have to be cold. It's a cold case now. <laughs> That's crazy. World 4 right now, then? Yeah. Okay. Um, back then... Bro, there is still half of this... There's another 30 minutes. I don't know where the fuck this is going to go. At this point, I've given up, okay? I've been trying to comprehend the actions, but the people don't move like normal humans uh, in this story. They they do things that are actually crazy. What shift were you working? Midnights. Back then, do you, did you tell them what this is in reference to? I told them we're yeah. working a, a, a old homicide. Okay. Are sure. you sure? Oh, Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Sorry to wake you up. I, I, I feel bad. We're just trying to, I guess, follow up on some leads and some other stuff that popped up. Um, did you know her at all? Very, very little. Very little. Just the officers have not mentioned Heather's name. Yet Daniel is already aware of who they are speaking of. Yeah, I mean, of course he. Very, would. I mean, very limited conversation. Yeah, like, I mean, uh, that's not, that's not. No, I don't even think that that's that suspicious because, like, yeah, if someone at your fucking workplace got murdered, like, you would know that that's why they're asking you, I right? Mean, I guess if you want to know how long I knew her, maybe um, three months, but how long I talked to her, maybe a couple of weeks, and I mean. You don't get long breaks at Whirlpool. So, right. I mean, it's like pee, eat within 10 minutes for first break. And it was very limited chit chat. The most suspicious part about this is not that he like immediately understood they're talking about uh, one of his coworkers that was brutally murdered in a fucking small town two years ago. But how many of the details he recalls from how limited their relationship was two years ago. Okay. That's the real component here. You you only you only fucking have like this kind of like quick response. This kind of quick response cuz like in a normal circumstance if someone comes up to you and you're like, "Hey, we're investigating a cold case about someone from 2 years ago." You'd be like, "Uh, okay, like, you know, whatever. Just let's say you know exactly who it was about, right?" Bro, these fucking flies are getting stronger. Like I Slam them on the fucking desk and they still survive. I don't know what the fuck that's about. Um, anyway, you, it, it sounds like he's basically re, uh, rehearsed lines 
uh, for uh, the moment. Did your mom open all the windows again? Yes. My mom. Mom? Anne. Even the chat knows. There's flies everywhere, which is very unique. It has it. It never usually happens. Oh, you're really annoyed with the flies? Okay, close all the windows, please, and the doors. Yeah, people in the chat are saying, you know Anne's home when Asan is sniping flies nonstop. Well, I mean, they know. They know because it's, it's a unique predicament. Oh, be fair to Anne, it's like 85 degrees out right now. Bro, I have the AC on way too much in the house. The fuck are you talking about? The AC's at like 66 degrees or some shit. And it's still hot as fuck in this room because they literally secretly turn it off, I'm pretty sure. Okay, okay. Did, did you work in the same area as her? Yes. Okay. Daniel claims that he and Heather had never talked outside of work and primarily discussed their children while they were on their breaks at Whirlpool. She was just a sweetheart. She was uh, very concerned about her kid, worked hard. She was always sweeping whenever she wasn't doing it. I mean, she was, it, it, it was sad. I guess I get from a little, it's a little odd that, you know, you guys are. Well, here, here's what I, I know. It's cold case and you guys are just, you know, grasping at straws. Trying we want to try, we want to try our best. Right. And a part. Bro, the cop talking to this guy who, like, someone has, like, emailed could be the guy who, uh, you know, there's at least, like, some uh, connection to the fucking victim. Uh, the way they're talking to him is like, I'm so sorry to bother you, sir. I love you. You seem like a great guy. You know, you're my best friend, actually. Can't wait to play pickleball with you later. Like, what is the, where is this energy when you were talking to the, the three random black people that you handpicked? I know it's not the same cop, but it is pretty fucking insane. Don't say they're trying to build a relationship to make him talk. The juxtaposition is what I'm talking about. Please, chatters, understand something here. You can do that rapport building with a black person too, okay? But they don't do that. Okay. Part of what we've been doing when we interview people, uh, we've been collecting uh, DNA buckle swabs. It's basically a Q-tip. This is a little thing, and then we're off on our way. Would you be, would you be all right with that? No reason why I would have to. Oh, you don't have to. No, this is part of. If there's an issue. I'll get an attorney or something. I didn't know really the lady or anything like that. But no, no, there's no. I'm nobody's saying that. This is just part of. Remember the other cop literally was like, if you if you hire an attorney, even though I'm unjustifiably saying that, like basically implying that I can make your life a living hell and have made your life a living hell, um, that means you're criminally liable. You're probably guilty. This guy's like, oh, I'm not gonna give you a DNA swab. Fuck you. And, and the other cop's like, oh, uh, sir, we love you. Can I kiss you? I think you're such a good guy. <laughs> Let's go to church together. Don't give me no DNA. Don't worry about that. It's just part of being thorough in what we're doing. I'll, I'll pass until there's some issues to where, you know, I'll get my attorney and see what he has Thank you for but, the tank of the sub. I'm going to pass on that. The detective is trying to make Daniel more comfortable by mentioning how they ask everyone to provide a DNA test so that he will be more inclined to agree. And while every single person had supposedly agreed to the buckle swab, Daniel is the first to say no, but there was a good reason behind his unwillingness to provide a sample. Two days later, authorities went knocking on his door once again. We need to follow up a little bit more in regard to that. All right. Because um, you, got, you came off work that morning, right? Right. Okay. And um, there was nobody else in your trailer at that time. Right. Right. Yeah. There was nobody else living but you no, at that time. No. And then Heather was down the area. Well, I don't know. How would I know that she's down the Well, you're at the trailer, and she's at the trailer. So that's what we need to get cleared up. And we know this. She wasn't in my trailer. He's like, sir, take your pants off. It's not that I want the DNA for the DNA swab. I want to suck your cock. Okay? Take your pants off. Let me suck it.
Let me suck your cock, sir. I want it for my own personal consumption. <laughs> there is no way she was in my. She was in your trailer. Okay, well then you're gonna have to show whatever that that she was there. The first time he says she wasn't in my trailer, Daniel ends with upward inflection, as though asking a question, not making a statement. The second time he says it more forcefully. It's almost like he had to ask it as a question first so he could repeat it to deny it. We know people struggle with outright lies, so this was likely a way to handle his nerves when deceiving the detective. Someone who is wrongfully accused of something is more likely to deny it using a firm tone of voice. An innocent person may even become a bit hostile. However, Daniel gives a quick and weak denial, and not only is his evasive response more than a little worrisome, but Daniel was also hiding a mountain of disturbing secrets, and his true atrocities were about to be revealed. I don't like because when you do that. I just don't know what you know, Heather, better than what you're telling us. You know what I did? Bro, this guy fucking, this guy folded under the lightest pushback, okay? This guy folded after this, the, the, the cop literally was like, I'll suck you, sir. I'll suck you off. I would like to, I would like to suck your pee-pee. And he's like, what? No! I didn't do a murder on April 19th, 2015. I was certainly not doing murders. I promise you. I did not know Heather that well. I didn't. There is no way. Okay. I don't know anything okay. about it. I know like the, uh, the inflection or whatever is pseudoscience. I'm sorry. This right here. But no, I did not know Heather. Like, come on. That's like an E-Rob level voice break. Okay. That's, no, that is the guiltiest fucking whine I've ever heard in my entire life, dude. Look at this. Oh, I did not know Heather that well. I didn't. Come on, dude. Come on, dude. That's like, he's squealing like a piglet, dude. I would fucking arrest him on a vibe check. Um, we will, we will, vibe check police. Vibe check police, you're going to jail. There is no way I don't know anything about her. Just a basic conversation that we had when we sat for a very limited break. That's all it was. You know Remember, this is literally two years ago. The fact that he has this level of detail, ready to go, ready to go, fired up, you know that's suspicious. Okay? That's more suspicious than his voice crack even. The fact that he's like, holy fuck, he had a script for two years. And he probably thought, man, these cops are so fucking dumb. Holy shit is crazy. What our car looked like, right? Yeah, I knew what it looked No, I didn't know what it looked like. I knew from the news, from online, Facebook. I mean, there's pictures from that's on the Facebook about the, uh, the car, when, you know, going by Miller's. It was a vision of a car. I mean, right. yeah, I mean, it, it's common knowledge. I mean, even the news was showing her vehicle, but... I've never seen her, her vehicle personally. We didn't draw your name out of a hat and show up at your door. Okay. So we're here asking you to help yourself out. Let us know what happened. Detectives are taught to never reveal to suspects what they know. And in addition, they want to give off the impression that they know more than they do. This accomplishes multiple things. For one, it allows officers to catch suspects in a lie. And two, suspects are left wondering how much police know. They may believe that police do know more than they actually do, which makes it more likely that they will let something slip. The officers further explain to Daniel that they are well aware of his involvement, but they want to hear from him just how that came to be, and more so, what exactly happened on that fateful day. She was never at your trailer before. No. Never. No. Okay. There's nothing for me to, to tell you. Daniel maintains that Heather was never at his trailer. However, he does give some information relating to what he discussed with her on April 9th at work that day. After failing her nursing exam, she was already feeling down on herself. But the cruel text she received from her brother had only worsened these emotions. When Heather saw the message from Josh around 3.44 a.m., Daniel was supposedly the shoulder that she would cry on. He states that nothing more happened, oh. but as police would soon learn, this couldn't be further from the truth. Oh, dude. Following the intense confrontation, they informed Daniel that there is a warrant for his trailer in addition to his DNA. 
From here on out, Daniel would be unable to hide the monstrous lie that was masked behind his seemingly normal facade. However, what you're about to see is more shocking than you could ever imagine. I don't like that. Taking a closer look, authorities were stunned to learn that Daniel had apparently mourned the loss of Heather. He attended her funeral and signed the registry book thereafter. Bro, this guy literally put a fucking billboard being like, I'm the murderer. And the cops were so busy trying to fucking arrest like random black people that they literally just missed the billboard being like, I'm the murderer, by the way. Just like that fucking email. Holy shit, two years, man. To pay his respects. Even going out of his way to donate $125 to the GoFundMe account of Heather's family, writing a now disturbing message. Heather, you were such an amazing person. Although we've only known one another for a short time, I've come to appreciate our talks about our kids. I'm distraught that there will be no more of your smile at work. You will always be in my thoughts. Your daughter will always be in my prayers. God bless you, little Missy. Danny and Ethan Myers. Apparently, he had also posted to Facebook that he was unable to eat or sleep due to the frightening situation. Daniel likely enjoyed inserting himself into Heather's world. Bro, he literally was just like, okay. I mean, he was just fucking signaling to everyone that he, he was, you know, out and about. Um, he, was, he was basically writing line items on how many... How many times he could get away with, like, uh, this crime, it seems. This way, he may have felt a secret thrill at the funeral, playing the part of a grieving co-worker, all while relishing in the fact that he was the only one who knew the truth about what happened to her. In addition, he may have believed that staying close to the situation would make him appear less suspicious. But <laughs> When, in fact, the only thing that, you know, uh, helped him get away with it was, uh, you know, him being white. You know, that's, turns out, it's just, that's what it was. The investigation continued. It was quite clear to police that things weren't adding up. Just five days after Heather was found, Daniel had purchased new plywood flooring for his home, and at the end of the month, a new mattress. Along with this, over a year later, he made a trip to the local dentist to repair a set of cracked and broken teeth. But the reason for the dental visit would be anything but typical. Several other purchases were also discovered, such as materials to repair a deck, lawn chemicals, light bulbs, galvanized nails, and paint. But this could all be explained away, even though a new revelation was far more difficult to rationalize. A warrant had finally been obtained to perform a DNA test on Daniel, and it concluded that the sample from underneath Heather's fingernails was a complete match to that of her co-worker. Over two years later, the truth of the devastating matter would Bro. finally be revealed. When police officially searched Daniel's trailer, the findings were unsettling, to say the least. Upon entering the residence, investigators found various adult toys, surveillance equipment, a Dell laptop, disposable cameras, handcuffs, jewelry, a pair of women's underwear, and a Samsung Galaxy cell phone. Furthermore, they located several... Okay, what the fuck? What... Why is he saying a dildo and then a Samsung Galaxy cell phone in the same sentence? Like it's like a, he was using that in the crime or something. <laughs> what the fuck? He's like, it's very disturbing that this criminal mastermind was using a Samsung instead of an iPhone. <laughs> Unless it's her phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like a Dell laptop. <laughs> red and brown stains on the bottom of Daniel's carpet. A sample taken from the rug would later come back positive for blood. Not only that, but Daniel had been keeping videotapes, documenting his encounters with women, and had bizarrely Googled nursing textbooks online. In addition, GPS locations from Daniel's truck uncovered that he had frequently driven by Heather's house between the months of March and April of 2015 and had even made his way to the Somerton apartments on one occasion. But once the horrific event took place, his travels around these specific locations came to a sudden halt. The Surprising, considering he went to the fucking funeral. This could suggest that Daniel was obsessed with Heather and stalking her, but at some point his behavior escalated. It's possible that if Heather discovered that he was following her and she confronted him, he may have lashed out. 
Alternatively, he may have expressed interest in her, and she rejected him, which made him angry. On top of this, there was also alleged evidence that Daniel may even be connected to more than one crime. On June 1, 2017, two years after Heather's horrendous murder, Daniel was finally taken into custody. One of the investigators asked the other officer to remove the handcuffs from Daniel and instead handcuffs him to a hard point in the interrogation room. It seems as though the officers aren't comfortable at this point to completely uncuff him. Okay, you, you were told you were under arrest, right? Okay. okay, no Miranda rights at all. Okay. See, nobody's spoken to you yet. That's what we're going to do right now. Right. Okay. You, you are under arrest. And, and that, I heard I heard Zeppi tell you that when we were out there. No, he's not. Okay. Dog, you got a fucking handcuff on you. You're under arrest, okay? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's fine. He said that he didn't tell you anything else. Right. Okay. We're here to tell you. This is in connection with the Heather Bowl. Okay. The officer reads Daniel his Miranda rights, and he quickly requests an attorney, although he still answers one question. What is your past for your phone? Right. Not a week. Um, write it down? Yes. 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 Passcodes. What a fucking idiot. Why would you ever say that, dumbass? I mean, I'm not rooting for the criminal here, but like, what an exceptionally stupid murderer, dude. What an exceptionally idiotic fucking murderer. Oh my lord. Mind boggling to me that this guy got away with a fucking gruesome murder for two goddamn years. There is literally no better indication of how fucking awful these cops are and also how, in many respects, white supremacy ends up harming white people regularly. It's the cellular phones are protected under the Fifth Amendment in some jurisdictions, and the contents of a phone are generally protected under the Fourth Amendment. In all likelihood, Daniel just waved... Bro, bro, the cops were like, damn... Like, that worked? <laughs> That's like, there's no, there is no world in which that works. Like, he literally was just like, can you give us your, your passcode to your phone? Wow, it worked. <laughs> we need to try that more. Hank, we got to try that next time. This shit is, these guys are dumb. Some very important Fourth and Fifth Amendment protections by voluntarily giving up his passcode and consenting to a search of his device. You should never give up a phone, its passcode, or its contents without a warrant. Even then, good counsel will attempt to have this warrant overturned or the admission of evidence obtained via the warrant excluded from evidence. By surrendering these rights, officers no longer need to develop probable cause to obtain a warrant in the first place. This essentially allows them to go on what attorneys call a fishing expedition, where they might find evidence of a crime but may also find additional evidence linking a suspect to other previously unknown or undiscovered crimes. Waiving these rights places the suspect in greater jeopardy from this perspective. Assuming the case goes to trial, the suspect has harmed their case by freely offering additional and possibly incriminating evidence to the prosecution. You get your attorney, you get situated in, you let me know. We'll sit down with you and your attorney. I think you got a story to tell. And it was quite the story. Following his arrest, 10 other women had come forward, claiming that they had been assault victims of none other than Daniel himself. And while incarcerated, the suspect had attempted to regain contact with many of his alleged victims by writing handwritten letters. Although in a conversation for... Wait, 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 wait. ...has harmed their case by freely offering additional and possibly incriminating evidence to the prosecution. You get your attorney, you get situated in, you let me know. We'll sit down with you and your attorney. I think you got a story to tell. And it was quite the story. Following his arrest, 10 other women had come forward, claiming that they had been assault victims of none other than Daniel himself. And while incarcerated, the suspect had attempted to regain contact with many of his alleged victims by writing handwritten letters. Although in a conversation from jail, he learns that this may not be a possibility. Bro, this motherfucker never really, like, made any attempts to hide his crimes, dude. 
Like, it that what the fuck? Handwritten? Like, paper trail shit? Like, he was just... Bro, this dude literally... If he wasn't caught for this, I feel like he was going to take out a billboard. I, I, I feel like... with at least one woman. All right, did you get a chance to um, go see what um, the address was? He said she does not want anything to do with you. Oh, well, how, how does that then? Why Talked to her about that? three weeks ago. Huh? Well, why didn't you mention something to me? Because then? I didn't want to hurt your feelings. Well, I don't hurt my feelings. I just wanted no, to send her, yep. send her a card, but... And she said don't, because if you do, she'll get you for harassment. I mean, a lot of these women that you want to send you trying to contact... They're scared of you, right? You know, I don't know, Danny. I don't know what you want to say. Right, well, enough said, enough said. And one of the letters Daniel wrote. I mean, this this is like Twitch stalker behavior. You know what I mean? Like dudes who stalk like Twitch streamers, like this is how they think that they have like a relationship. But he had it with like eleven people. So many emotions in one. Not sure why I'm writing now. First off, I guess you really. Okay, I'm sorry, but his handwriting is, is quite nice. That's unrelated to the issue at hand, but holy fuck, that's a, a beautiful uh, cursive. They didn't know me after all. I was never violent with you. You enjoyed my forcefulness. You told me many times. Almost bro, bro is out here literally doing an Andrew Tate. Like, this is Andrew Tate WhatsApp messages to his victim. Like, this is, this is the same energy. Most instructed me on what to do. You always told me you like to be held down. Maybe your memory wasn't as good as mine. As the note continued, Daniel insisted that the unknown person was in favor of his disturbing actions. Although it hasn't been documented if Daniel was ever diagnosed, people with antisocial personality disorder often engage in this sort of emotional manipulation of their victims. They will attempt to persuade the victim into believing that they were at fault for the abusive actions. They're highly skilled at making victims doubt their own sanity along with their own memory of events, as Daniel is doing here with this letter. This is called gaslighting. In this case, he doesn't want anyone testifying against him, and he can't try to scare them into submission from his cell. So he needs to use his words to manipulate them into thinking they are wrong about what happened. And as we hear from one of Daniel's supposed acquaintances, Danny Fry, the horrifying nature of the suspected killer was confirmed even further. Well, the whole time I've known him, he's been a womanizer, you know. It, it's his way or, you know, no way. Bro, that's not womanizer. That's, that's called being a, a, a serial rapist. And um, I know at one time, and this was... Sure, God, it had been at least 20 years ago. But I believe a girl had to put a restraining order on him because he was stalking her. Danny's descriptions of the accused murderer is an excellent depiction of a person with antisocial personality. <laughs> yeah, he's a big womanizer. He was womanizing so hard that they had to put a restraining order on him. It's like, first of all, why are you friends with this person? That's number one. Number two, that's like... Like, do motherfuckers just not know how, the difference? Like, <laughs> he's such a womanizer. He was stalking the shit out of these women. <laughs> what the fuck? Reality disorder. These individuals will often put their needs first and have little to no concern for the needs and feelings of others. This is how people like Daniel are able to commit such horrific crimes. In fact, people with severe antisocial personality sometimes derive pleasure from seeing the pain of their victim, physical or emotional. Many of these individuals are considered sadistic for this reason. He was dating her, and she broke up with him, and he couldn't let it go. This is because individuals with antisocial personality disorder don't consider the feelings or desires of the other person. They function in pursuit of what they want, and only what they want. Additionally, these individuals often have an inflated sense of self. Many of them think so highly of themselves that it is to the point of delusion. This can often cause them to become very vindictive, and even aggressive if a love interest or romantic partner rejects them. 
He was married to a, a girl named Kimberly at one time, and I guess she didn't tell me until here a while back that he used to be abusive to her, too. And then he was also married to a Bobby girl one at one time, and she said that he was abusive. Daniel and Bobby had a daughter together named Tabitha. On March 28, 2018, she sat down with detectives to give chilling details on the horrors that she encountered as a child, all thanks to her father. Supposedly, when she would visit Daniel every other week, seeing as he and Bobby were no longer together, Daniel would always have a new woman at the house while acting out his violent fantasies. To no surprise, the women were allegedly under Daniel's rule, whereas he would punish them if he didn't approve. This is just demonizing people with mental health issues. What the fuck? The dude is just a POS. It's not that he's antisocial. Like, there's plenty of antisocial personalities who don't do chatter. Antisocial personality disorder is a very specific term, uh, colloquially known as uh, sociopathy or, or, or psychopathy, okay? That's what that is. That is actually a correct assessment. It doesn't mean someone is antisocial and like doesn't or introverted. Okay. Not just like, oh, this was a shy guy. No. It's a very specific term. And it's the correct term in that situation. They also openly admit that they didn't die, that this person wasn't diagnosed with it, but they went to a clinical psychologist to diagnose or to make this assessment. So the video is actually correct. It has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with like being awkward or being a shy guy. As a matter of fact, a lot of people who are psychopaths are not shy at all. Because they uh, do not have any kind of uh, mental burdens that stop them from feeling like embarrassed or whatever. Not a, it's not. Yeah, but like calling it antisocial personality disorder still hurts my feelings. Please stop. Okay, shut the fuck up. Yeah, it just means that they, uh, as this chatter correctly points out, that they are neurologically incapable of feeling empathy. Obviously, it doesn't matter. There's so much that we don't know about. There is no like full assessment on this. Because of the, the nature of this disorder, uh, it is... Um, I have ASD and I feel empathy still. Yeah, ASD is not... What the fuck are you saying? Isn't AS the autism spectrum? What? Yeah, you're autistic. That's different. I'm losing my fucking mind, dude. Holy fuck. People were just like... <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's really fucked up, dude. I'm a very shy guy, and it seems like you're saying that all shy people are mass murderers and serial killers. Anyway, listen. Antisocial personality disorder is... 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 Uh, hard to make assessments on, hard to medically solve. Um, given the nature of, of uh, the disorder itself... Uh, you know, people can be very manipulative about it. It's one of the reasons why I say that I am not fully in support of like full blown prison abolition. Um, there are, uh, you know, there are plenty of, um, according to studies, there are people who are overrepresented with antisocial personality disorder, both in prison and also in uh, high levels of, of uh, government and uh, corporate executive boards. So people in prison and people who should be in prison, that sort of thing. Um, but it, it's difficult. It's a very difficult thing to make assessments on. 
it's a very difficult uh, reason to make uh, uh, medical assessments on, and it's an incredibly difficult uh, uh, thing to technically medically cure. Stuff is sickening, but at the same time, it's supposed to be one of the dumbest criminals of all time. Yeah. I'm an antisocial personality disorder, ASPD. I just forgot the P, my bad. Oh. Yeah, that doesn't mean if you, ha if you are uh, diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, that doesn't mean you're going to be a fucking violent murderer or that you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to, con you're, you're, you're going to do, uh, you have violent urges or you're going to lean into having, uh, lean into violent urges that you may or may not have. That doesn't mean that at all. Plenty of people who are diagnosed don't actually have it. It's, I mean, it's a fucking, it's like, it's the same case with like every other kind of disorder. Anyway. But as it stands, there is no... The word disorder triggered the Twitter pathologizers. Yes, it did. Very frustrating. Um, dumb stun lock on pause and obby. I don't think it's a dumb stun lock because um, it's at the heart of like uh, my advocacy. It doesn't stop me from... It does not stop me from obviously still focusing on rehabilitation over incarceration, but also... It is an unfortunate, uh, it is unfortunately a very, uh, I wouldn't say hard thing to solve, but you're not allowed to diagnose someone with ASPD before age 18 because the diagnosis carries such significant stigma and people get misdiagnosed at young ages so frequently. Uh About 1% of the population that at large that have, that are or have ASPD, executives and such are about 3%, so three times more, but not a high percentage. Um, yes, but uh, in, in the prison population, it's much, har uh, much higher. Anyway, let's continue. Of their behavior. He would reportedly grab the woman by her. You got called out. I wasn't planning on going to Tushkan to you, but it turns out my cousin's wedding is in Germany in the same week. Uh, I'll be in convention, never attend to Europe. Wow, wow. First time in Paris and Germany, world traveler. Don't tweet at me while watching crime vids without me, traitor. Okay, if anything, this is her fault. I mean, honestly. Gaslighting. <laughs> Your clothes or hair and take them to his bedroom. Once the door closed, Tabitha could supposedly hear the blood curdling screams coming from inside of the torture chamber. It was something that she would never forget. When he dated, you know, he, he was dominant. You know, right. they'd done what he told them to. No, no first-hand knowledge or witness of anything like that. No, I've never, I mean, I've never seen him physically hit a woman or nothing, you know, just what they've told me and, you know, things like that. Okay. And I mean, then... I don't know if my sister told you, but she had told me, uh, I think it was beginning of the summer or whatever, that he tried to handcuff her to a chair. Oh. He paid her to come clean his trailer, and he tried to handcuff her to a chair. Wow. Bro, I feel like this is the type of shit you should probably let cops know about. Like, when it happens, you know what I mean? Not, like, later. Like, this guy is just, like... <laughs> this guy is just, like, leaking shit after the fact, and it's insane to me that he's just, like... Yeah, this guy's a real bad guy. He murdered people left and right, you know? 
He was a real womanizer that way. He was, he was out there murdering so much. We kept saying, hey, man, you're a real big murderer. We love that about you, you know? But, uh, <laughs> like, why is he so fucking chill? What the fuck? He was on his radar? Yeah, he's like, hey. <laughs> Cops like, D dude, dude, hold on, hold on. We got to write this down. He's like, well, you know, there's a lot to write more about. I mean, she did have bruises on her, you know, her wrist and stuff. He also claims that Daniel would use derogatory terms when referring to his girlfriends, basically to the point of dehumanization. This suggests that Daniel may have had a paraphilia-related mental disorder known as sadism, where an individual gains satisfaction when causing pain or fear in their partner. On top of this, psychopathy and sadism are linked, although the cause of this is unknown. But as we creep a little further down this twisted path, we learn that Daniel's crimes were darker, and there's a chance that Heather wasn't his only victim. Did you know Leanne Sluter? No, I did not. Okay. Yeah, there was about five or six years there that me and him didn't talk because my house got broken into and uh, some people told me that it was him because they seen him walking from behind my house that night. Leanne Sluter, a girlfriend of Daniel's from years earlier and the mother of his child, Ethan Meyer, had tragically taken her own life back in 2009. Or at least that's what authorities concluded based on her sudden death. But others believe that to be an utter and complete. Bro, uh, uh, hello. That's a. I mean, that's a cold case too. I think lie, especially Leanne's sister, Lorianne Haley. In 2009, Daniel had apparently walked into Leanne's home, finding her lifeless body resting on the bed with a single twenty. Bro, this is like a. You know when like a fucking piece of shit cop that was like, you know, planting evidence gets caught. And then they look through all of their prior clearances. You know what I mean? They look through all their prior convictions, right? And arrest record. And sometimes if you have like a woke George Soros DA, they'll conduct an investigation and actually uh, realize that like half of those motherfuckers were literally uh, innocent and they'll release them. That's what they should do in this situation with this fucking guy. I mean, what the hell? He shot herself in the chest? Like, they saw someone shoot themselves in the fucking chest as a suicide, and we're like, probably just a, yeah, no reason to believe otherwise. Two caliber rifle gunshot wound to her chest. <laughs> I brought my son home to his mom because we had the weekend deal, and I was here like an hour ago, and she didn't have to go, and I'm like, well, maybe she's in the shower, so I went back home. Well, I had a key to get her home, and I came in, and... Bro, motherfuckers act like RoboCop when you got, like, any kind of weed on you, okay? But, like, when you're... <laughs> When you're out here doing, like, multiple murders and shit, routinely abusing women and shit, like, cops are just like, oh, I can't, I'm, I can't see nor hear anything. I don't know what's going on. This guy seems very innocent to me. Let's let him go. I shoot, 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 shoot. I someone come out here ASAP. When someone starts telling an elaborate story during a 911 call, this is a major red flag for deception. Most people who find a dead body would request help right away and then answer pertinent questions that the operator may have. I mean, that's not enough to fucking convict someone, but it certainly is curious. Have, rather than delivering a monologue about how they came to find the scene, it already sounds like he's potentially building up an alibi. But the barrel of the firearm had been exceedingly long, and the trigger would have potentially been too far to pull had it been facing towards Leanne. Not only that, but the gun was resting quite neatly beside her, almost as if someone else had placed it there after committing the ultimate crime. However, there was also a note supposedly written by Leanne that Daniel had kept hidden away. Part of it reads, I have loved you unconditionally without waiver, and all you ever did was use me as a bank, kick me to the side when the next best thing came along. All I ever wanted was to just die so that the hurt would stop. The note had supposedly been written in Leanne. 
Bro, when I see stuff like this, like, listen, LAPD is dog shit, $8 million a day burn rate. Like, they fucking, they, they're horrible. And then I see a whole new level of incompetence when I look at, like, small town police departments that have, like, armored personnel carriers and, like, just fucking, you know, <laughs> minefield clearance devices and shit just for the sake of funsies to have it. And then this is the way they're operating. Like, how? How? How the fuck? It, it's because they're defunded, bro. Yeah, I know. They, they can't even fucking buy the $5 a month subscription at the top of the hour, these, uh, these small town cops. It's pretty fucked up. Many murders go unsolved simply because people don't talk. Dude, what are you saying? What do you mean many murders go unsolved simply because people don't talk? The fuck are you talking about? They already said the family literally said there's no way this was a suicide. And also, you don't need someone to talk in this regard. Look at the barrel and how long the fucking rifle is and how it was gently laid aside this person. And they were just like, all right, rule it a suicide. Let's call it a day. Are you fucking nuts? Are you fucking insane? You must think that you'll uh, avoid the top of the hour ad break without subscribing. That's crazy to me. Okay. Here's a three minute ad break now. If you're lucky, you might get gifted a sub, by the way. handwriting is reported by authorities but even if the note did come from Leanne there's no way to know that she did so of her own volition given Daniel's behavior toward other women it's likely that he treated her in a similar manner authorities have maintained their original ruling to this very day but many have suggested that a certain someone was actually behind her death all along